So I will talk about topological recursion for double Hubis numbers. And uh, so this is a work in collaboration with uh, Guillaume Chapuis, Sylvain Charbonnier, and Elba Garcia Falde. So I figured because they are in the room, but Elba is organizing, she won't talk about that. And uh, I don't have so many opportunities to talk about that in the combinatorics community. So I think that's a good opportunity. And uh, although, so I feel a bit like a master in deception because I submitted a different abstract and then got accepted and then decided to change it. Um, we also had a special assist from Marie Albanque and Jamie Boutier uh, because they provided some great techniques to find the spectral curve that I'll tell you about. So uh, we start with the partition lambda, that's a um, finite sequence of non-increasing integer, positive integer, like uh, 5, 3, 1, 1, over there. The size of lambda is the sum of the lambda i's, and they are relevant in the representation theory of the symmetric group because of conjugacy classes. So the conjugacy class of a permutation sigma is the, well, you conjugate and look at all the elements that you get that, like that, and they all have the same cycle type. So if I have a sigma like this and rho like that, they both have a cycle of three elements and another one of two elements, so you can just look at them and say they are in the same conjugacy class. So if I give you a, a permutation, you can list the length of the cycle of, of that permutation by decreasing order and encode that into a partition of n. Uh, for instance, so those partitions, those permutations, they have partition three, two. One to the n is one, 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 one. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm head of studies uh, duty. It's gonna, probably gonna pop up a few times. <laughs> um, so one to the n is the class of the identity, and those partitions, they actually label all the conjugacy classes, and they also pop up when you represent the symmetric group because they label irreducible representations of SN. For, uh, those two items are for the same reason, in fact. Okay. So now I'm considering a classical problem in combinatorics, which is that of ordered factorization in SN. So you fix some partition lambda zero to lambda m, which are gonna be cyclic types, and you want to enumerate some tuples of permutations satisfying that uh, constraints like that, where sigma i is of cyclic type lambda i. Okay, so for instance, uh, with three elements uh, and m equals two, I can take sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two to be the cycle one, two, three, and because it's an element of order three in the symmetry group, that factorizes to the identity. Okay, that's an example. Now, uh, the enumeration problem is solved by something called Frobenius formula. And so in this talk, I will sometimes flash a symmetric function formula that I will not explain, but uh, like for people who know about them, it gives them a, a way to anchor uh, the, the talk. So here, the generating series is written as a, a sum of a partitions with the product of, of uh, sure functions. And from that formulation, you can directly prove the KP hierarchy, for instance. But uh, we're not gonna stop here. It's not the end of the story because we want to extract information, more information, uh, like recursion relations between the coefficients of, uh, of, of tau, prove interesting properties, and at my disposal, I will have combinatorics and emphasize on I have my, my disposal, uh, bijective combinatorics, some algebraic combinatorics and generating functions. That's what I'm, I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna tell you more about who of its problems and end up with a, the specific problem that we addressed. So uh, I call a, a run of transposition uh, row which is just a finite sequence of transpositions. And it's monotone if when you write the transposition as A uh, smaller than B, uh, you have a um, non-decreasing sequence of Bs, okay? So it might seem weird at first, but it's gonna be very natural 
uh, in terms of uh, UC Smurfy elements that Benoit said he will talk about tomorrow, and I will not introduce them, but in fact, they're natural. So instead of the previous problem what I had, where I had M uh, permutations and some arbitrary cyclic types, I can do uh, sort of the reverse and fix the, um, the partitions, like transpositions, and release M, okay? So simple Hovis numbers are like that. You take a run of transpositions that are, and, and you take the product of the transposition, so I call that row underlined. And you ask that it's a product of two permutations with given cyclic types, lambda and u. Uh, you can do the same with monotone runs. And in our work, what we studied is the following objects. So you will have m permutations with, uh, where you do not know the cyclic type, but you count the number of cycles, for the sigma 1 to sigma n. Then you have J monotone runs, so J is fixed, like M, and you can add a simple run of Hovitz numbers. And on the right-hand side, you want to control the cyclic type of lambda nu, of uh, lambda nu of two permutations. And it, it was shown by Gepak and Harnard that the, um, the generating function has this form, so product of two sure functions and a product over the cell G of the contents of the, of the cell. So here, what I want you to just look at is that the UN, they keep track of the number of cycles of sigma i to sigma uh, 1 to m, and the VIs, they keep track of the number of um, runs. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, simple who of it, they are above. It's like when you have a product of transpositions. Yeah. So the, that G is called a weight function. It's typically rational with an exponential weight for the simple Hovis numbers. Okay. So it's just in case you've already seen that uh, kind of a function, it's called a hypergeometric tau function. Uh, so that problem that I introduced for purely combinatorial reasons, uh, it also pops up in enumerative geometry. Uh, as counting ramified coverings of the sphere, and we had lectures from uh, Alexander Hawk and Enzo Cavalieri in the previous two days about that. So I just want to make the link very quickly. So the product of, of permutations being one means that you have a constraint on the monodromies because you are covering the sphere, basically, where lambda i is the ramification profile of sigma i with the li parts. And the genus is given by the riemann hovitz formula that I wrote there. So in this talk, I will not adopt that point of view at all, because it's definitely not what I'm comfortable with. So I will use uh, combinatorics instead, and I will represent those objects as special combinatorial maps that we call constellations, which were introduced by Lando and Vankin in the early 2000s, I think. Uh, what I'm interested in are some, is some kind of universal structures that we find typically both in enumerative geometry and uh, in combinatorial maps, which are the KP hierarchy and the topological recursion. So the natural question is, in the, in the problems that I mentioned on the previous slide, are they satisfied? So KP has been known for some time because of the sure expansion that I showed you. Like it tells you directly that's a KP tau function. Uh, but for the topological recursion, it was proved just recently, and this is what I want to talk about. So it was proved independently, and the papers appeared on the same day, by two groups. Uh, one, which is basically Guillaume Chapuis with different collaborators over the years, and another one that, were, <laughs> that was much more consistent, uh, with uh, Bishkov, Dunit, Barkowski, Kazarian, Chodrin. And they also worked, those two groups worked with the same um, steps. So in 2020, they proved uh, the topological recursion with no internal phases. I will define what that means. And then in 2022, uh, the full thing with internal phases. And I also want to tell you why it's difficult and uh, why it took uh, some time. So the basic objects I will consider are combinatorial maps. 
layer defined like that. You take a bunch of polygons uh, and you glue them side by side. Uh, and like if you choose that specific pattern, you're gonna have the thing on the right hand side. And by the way, the yellow triangle that's on the left is now on the ex is the external region on the right. Okay, so you're really on the sphere. So they have more structure and graphs because they have vertices and edges. But also those polygons that are glued together. So uh, we call them faces in that context. And we have objects that are really topological surfaces. There's a nice interplay between combinatorics and topology that's super well known and given by Euler's formula for the genus of the surface that you built, uh, which is this combinatorial formula where G is a positive integer, non-negative integer. So. so I will give you some examples of maps, and the first one is a counter example uh, of something that's not a map. So it has one vertex, one edge wrapping around non-contractible cycle of the torus. So why is it not a map? Because if you cut uh, along that edge, you're gonna get a cylinder, and that's not a polygon, okay? So by definition, it's not a map, because I need to glue polygons. However, on the right-hand side, you have something that's a genuine uh, map. It's also planar, obviously, and it's also bipartite, because the underlying graph is bipartite. There, I have a planar triangulations with two different representations because I can just deform the edges however I want. What's really important is how is the, are the incidence relations between the, the triangles, okay? And we'll see why we can encode that with permutations. And here it's uh, quadrangulations, meaning that uh, I have glued rectangles, quadrangles if you want. Okay, I can also look at things that have non-zero genius. Uh, like on the left-hand side, this is my favorite rectangle where I identify the opposite uh, sides. So if I do that, I get a cylinder and then glue the two sides of the cylinder. Uh, and then I can represent it like on this picture in the right-hand side. And you're gonna tell me what does that mean? Well, I have just one vertex when I glue the, the rectangle. I have one vertex and two edges. And what I'm gonna do, so the two edges are uh, the, the purple and the gold one. What I'm gonna do is follow the corners uh, along the rectangle in the counterclockwise uh, direction. Yeah. So if I do that, I need to encounter first uh, a yellow, then a purple, then yellow, purple again, okay? So I have to have this picture. And where is the surface of the rectangle? It's basically everywhere now. There's only a single face. So obviously, if you're gonna draw uh, surfaces of non-vanishing genius in the plane, you're gonna have crossings. That's why we have that map of genius one, map of genius two, and so on. Okay. Now, why, why are they the same as uh, factorization of permutations? Uh, well, so I'm gonna do first the example in the bipartite case, and then I'll move on to defining constellations. Uh, so I take a bipartite map, which is a very simple one with only two vertices, three edges, and I label the edges. I label the edges, I fix an orientation, which is here uh, counterclockwise, and then I'm gonna write, I'm gonna record the, the labels of the edges that I uh, see when I go counterclockwise around the vertex, okay? So if I go counterclockwise around the black vertex, I meet three, two, and one in that order, okay? And if I do that around the, the white vertex, I get one, two, and three counterclockwise, okay? So obviously that gives me permutations. Here they are super simple because they have a single cycle, but I can have more cycles if I have more vertices. On the right-hand side, what I did is to, uh, to switch, to swap the edges one and two on the white vertex side, okay? So it gives me a different permutation and a map of a different genus because it's planar on the left and has genus one on the right. So now I'll move on to constellations. I hope uh, that's not gonna be too scary. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm in the symmetry group SN, I'm gonna draw. N, N plus one gons, 
okay? Which are, so usually we say they are black, but for some reason they are blue here. Uh, and I'm gonna color the vertices from zero to M. Okay, so I took three of them, they're labeled. I took three of them. And now I'm gonna glue them along their vertices, not their edges, along their vertices. Uh, I'm gonna identify vertices which have the same color. And how do I do that? I do that with the permutations that I'm given. So if I have a permutation sigma C, so I say that C is the color, and it has several cycles. When I look at the cycles, I encounter some labels. And the way I glue things is by uh, gluing the corresponding uh, blue gowns around the vertex of that color, okay? So here is sigma C, so color C, and I have a cycle one, four, eight, two, nine. So one, four, eight, two, nine counterclockwise. Okay. And I have a second cycle, so a second vertex. Uh, obviously, there are maps because I have an order of the colors around the blue polygons and I have an order around the vertices here. So there are combinatorial maps. And in fact, all this formula is going to give you the Riemann Huvitz formula. They are the same. Okay, I haven't told you about the factorization constraint. I just told you you can encode uh, the, the vertices using permutations. So uh, if I have this factorization constraint, it means that when I apply sigma m, sigma m minus one uh, up to sigma zero, I have to go back to my original blue polygon, okay? So this is represented with the cycle arrows. With the, so, uh, yeah. uh, so in particular, it means that all the white faces, they have uh, length m plus one. Okay, so it's very it's very constrained system. And that's not super convenient for combinatorics. So what we do is some kind of trivial bijection, uh, which might look a bit wild when I show you, but, but it's very simple in fact. So we're gonna turn the vertices of color zero into white faces of the same degree. Okay, we want to get rid of the constraints on, that the white faces have degree M plus one. So here I have in the middle a vertex of color zero with three incident blue polygons. And what I'm gonna do is chop the blue polygons between the colors one and three. So like vertically on, for, for the one on the, on the left, okay? So I'm gonna chop them and remove the color zero, okay? So it gives me something like this. So you see in the middle, I chop the, the blue polygons and get that. And I also have to do that for all the vertices of color zero, even the ones that are not in the middle of the picture. So uh, it gives me this, okay? And now that's very convenient for combinatorics. Uh, if M equals two, I get back to bipartite map because, because basically the, the blue polygons are digons, okay? So I can replace a digon with just a single edge and two colors. But at m equal three, I get new objects that are called constellations. And here I've listed the three objects of size two, meaning two blue uh, guns. Two of them are planar, one is not planar, and I can obviously flip the colors. Okay, so I want to enumerate those objects, and here is my crash course on uh, generating functions on maps. So a partition is blah, 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 something that I already told you. Uh, like three, two, two, one, we'll encounter that partition again. And what I want you to notice is uh, if I give you a bipartite map like this one, you can record the degree of the vertices, the black and the white vertices, into partitions. So let's say I have uh, four white vertices, one of degree one, another one of degree one on the, on the right, and two of degree three. So that gives me a partition three, three, one, one. And same for vertices, uh, for black vertices. I have two of degree four here. Uh, so that's two partition, and I have third one, because if I look at the faces now, uh, it's bipartite. So if I go around the face, I go white, black, white, black, white, black. So. The, the, the length is even, and I call the degree of the face half 
that length. Okay. So for instance, for instance, uh, the diagon over there uh, is of degree one because it has length two. Then the quadrangle in the middle has degree two. Okay. And again, I can record the degrees of the faces into a partition that I call lambda faces, which here is three to two. Um, okay. So I have three partition encoding, not encoding, um, but associated to the map. And now I will form a generating uh, function uh, by having Rick, uh, by recourse to an infinite set of indeterminate, the PIs, and if I have a partition lambda, I call P lambda the product of the P lambda i's, okay, over all the parts of lambda. Like P for the partition three, two to one, is P three times P two squared, because there are two twos, times P one. Okay, and then I denote BN of those uh, three partitions, the number of bipartite maps, with n labeled edges, white vertex degrees encoded by lambda white, black vertex degrees in, encoded in lambda black, and face degrees by lambda faces. And um, I write this big generating series where I need three types of indeterminates because I have three partitions. So I have the P's, I have the Q's, I have the R's. And the weight system looks like this. So the P's are for the white faces, so P1 because it has degree 1, P2 because it has degree 2. Then the Qs are for the, the white vertices, so Q1 because it's a white vertex of degree 1, Q3 because it's a white vertex of degree 3. And the R are for the black vertices. Okay? So that would be the weight associated to that map with the T to the 8 because it has 8 edges. Yes? Yeah, they, they, they all sum to n, to the number of edges. Like um, in the previous picture, it was clear. Uh, so if you take the sum of the parts on the right-hand side, you get 8 in all three cases, because it's a map with 8 edges. Okay. No, 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 no. Otherwise, the triple Hovitz number associated would be one. Uh, let me think. No, no, it's. Oh, yeah, be, because you have that constraint here. No. So basically, you can specify any set of permutations up to the last one, and the last one is determined by the others. So that's definitely true. Okay, okay, so I was there, and now I have this kind of triple Hovis numbers, uh, but it's too complicated to write an equation or a bijection for that. So nobody knows how to do anything with that, except you writing a short expansion. So what we typically do is get rid of the weights for the black vertices and only count how many there are. So I have a variable u, and here it's squared because I have two black vertices. So I don't care about the degrees, I only care about how many there are. And now it's tough, but it's not impossible to write an equation on the, on the generating function. It's been done by some uh, smart people. Uh, I learned recently something very funny. That's, um, so basically, it's the two matrix model. And, and I wrote solution, I think, in 2002 or 2004. And uh, Buscamenu and Schaeffer also did the same at the same time, completely independently. And they didn't know uh, they both had the same, done the same thing until like a few weeks ago. Uh, and they wrote exactly the same rational parametrization. So like it's a convergence of uh, knowledge or background, I don't know. But they wrote exactly the same result at the same time. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this talk is simplify a bit, because otherwise that would be too complicated. And I'm going to uh, get rid of the weights of the white vertices on only count how many are with the new variable v. Okay? So this we can do in that talk, in the present talk.
Now, because I want to talk about the topological recursion, I also need to introduce uh, correlators and boundaries. So a boundary is a, a choice of a marked face with a marked corner. So if I have my favorite bipartite map here, I can decide that I want to mark that face with uh, this corner. And because it's the first face that I mark, it's going to have a variable x1. And because it has degree 2, it's x1 squared. Okay. So, so the subscript is the, the uh, it registers how many faces I have marked, and the superscript is the degree. So here I'm marking a second face of degree two, so x2 squared, and I can go on and mark all the faces if I, if I want to. So it gives me a notion of correlators, and, uh, and then the notion of multi-differential um, omega gn, when I choose a specific uh, map x of z that I will talk about. Okay, so the previous works in 2020 by those two groups, they were for uh, constellations with no internal faces. So that kind of maps that I draw here with only boundaries, only boundary faces. Oh, that's the external face. Yeah, I count every, co every white corner. Every time I go around a, a white vertex, I count it. So uh, three times. Uh, no, I count them all. X2 squared on the right hand side. Yeah. Because if I go around, okay, let me have some chalk. Uh, it's something like that. No. So if I go around, I do something like that. So it's degree one because I went around uh, and then like that, so degree two. Okay. So you pick up a degree every time you go around a, a white corner. Is that okay? Okay, so why, why is the TR formula quadratic? Uh, that will be my question for a few slides. Uh, so this is your favorite formula, and it's obviously quadratic. So for maps or bipartite maps, it's quite, quite clear why. If you look at the disk function, omega zero one, so genus zero one boundary, so disk, and you look at the, the root, uh, which is the marked corner here, uh, it can be incident either to a bridge, meaning that if I remove that edge, I disconnect, or not, not a bridge. So in that case, it separates two faces like that, but I don't care about that case. I want to focus on, my, on, on that one, uh, because it gives me an, a, an equation that starts like omega zero one is something squared, because I can glue any disk function on the two sides, plus some things. So if I go to higher order uh, correlators, I basically linearize that equation and get something that's quadratic and that resembles a lot the TR formula. Uh, so does it work in the same way for constellations? Obviously not. So you're going to look at what happens around uh, a, a marked white face with, with the arrow marking the white corner. And on the right of that corner, you have a blue polygon. Okay, so you look at whatever that's glued around that blue polygons, polygon, and you can have contributions like those, where the m or m plus one contributions are disconnected. So that gives you an equation that starts like omega zero one equals omega zero one to the m plus blah blah blah. And if you go to higher order correlators, you have something of degree m. So it doesn't look at all like the topological recursion. It looks like you have something of uh, larger order. If you go to matrix models, that doesn't help because there is a matrix model that was, I think, introduced by Ambion Cherov, not sure, but they worked on it. And it's too complicated because it has several uh, matrices which do not commute, so you cannot really diagonalize. However, uh, the, the modern formulation of topological recursion, at least the most modern for me, is 
that I don't use those equations that I showed you before, but I need something uh, that's weaker, which are the linear and quadratic loop equations. And you can get them from the KP hierarchy, for instance. So that's what those two groups did in 2020. They obtained the linear quadratic loop equations, uh, which are quadratic, and proved the topological recursion without internal faces. So that's why it was difficult, because if you write the naive equations, they are not quadratic. At least that's my point of view. So what level of generality uh, we were looking for? We want some weights pk on the faces of degree k, the white faces, some weights qk's on vertices of color one, some weights depending on the colors on, on the vertices. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are also quadratic, right? So how do you get around this issue that the things that you get are not quadratic? I mean, the loop equations are also quadratic. No, no. Uh, linear or quadratic. Sorry? The loop equations are also linear and quadratic. Yeah, sure. And the DR formula is also quadratic, right? Yeah, so that's uh, why you end up with a quadratic formula. Right, but then how do you get around this issue that you're saying that the things that you, these contributions that you oh, get are okay. not quadratic? Because you take it, so, so I don't know how to get the linear quadratic loop equations from the that uh, thing in the book. Probably it's possible, I don't know how to do it. Uh, but people did it with, uh, with the KP hierarchy, which is itself quadratic. So I'm wondering if the quadraticity, quadraticness of the TR is related to the quadraticity of the KP hierarchy, maybe. It would be a question for Sagay, for instance. <laughs> like the answer is no, or it's not a question for you? Sure. Yeah. The operator is in fact a linear combination of uh, very well known high order operators, the ones that are coming from completed cycles essentially. And you know that abstraction for each of them, I mean, uh, for uh, having your favorite quadratic expression, uh, well, uh, for this expression uh, that you get on the right-hand side of the whole. So when you start to uh, skew symmetrize it near critical points, abstraction to, for it to be holomorphic is quadratic. It's basically what we did with Gaetan for uh, R equals to three and for any R with Peter, uh, Rainier, and <coughs> so, so basically, basically here, even from this equation, though it looks of, of higher order, so there is some quadraticity hidden inside when you start to skew symmetrize with respect to the transformation near the near the critical points. It's it's also the same as for R spin and what you guys are doing. Like uh, for R spin, you have a higher order curve that you can deform it and uh, the limit that works. But but it's like the degree of the curve versus the like the order of the ramification points. Or? Yes. Okay. So it's just that this equation is written in expansion near natural yeah. expansion point where you read off the enumerative information. Yeah. So that's the degree. That's counting the degree of the curve. Yes. Right? And uh, yeah. So yeah, basically. So what, what happened that you have in fact a full? You always have the full tower of equation up to the degree, but it turns out that for generic cases, um, you just need the two first one, the linear and the quadratic, to totally determine what is the what are the correlators. <laughs> If you have a non-generic case, then you would need maybe more equations. But you always have all of them, up to the degree. Uh, yeah, so that was the problem I wanted to, um, the generating functions I, I wanted to evaluate. So I need uh, basically a lot of things. The one thing I, I'm not trying to do here is to have monotone and, uh, runs and simple uh, transpositions. I can add them later on, okay? So for instance, that uh, constellation would have uh, those, uh, that weight system here. I'm not explaining in detail, that would take maybe too long. Uh, what was known before is basically item one and item two separately. So uh, constellations with only the PKs that was done again by Buscamelu and Schaeffer, although it was a different paper, and then revisited by Jectively, by Alban and Boutier. And on the other side, the item two weights, uh, so one and two, PK in Q case, but not for constellations. So that's the two matrix model, basically. So what you have to do is 
uh, put everything that's been done together and add the item three. Okay, so basically the technology is here. You just have to do the double Almanc Boutier. Uh, and uh, we are very grateful that they shared the result with us, which is uh, not released yet. So the technology is something that generalizes the mobiles that we heard about from, I think, Marvin on Monday. It's called Slices. They were introduced by Boutier and Guiter. And I will present them with uh, bipartite maps only. Uh, okay, that was weird. Uh, <clears throat> so in to introduce slices, I need uh, a root, so that's basically a marked corner or marked uh, an oriented edge, like I have on the top uh, drawing. And I also need a pointed vertex, okay, which is just a distinguished vertex, and it's the, the purple one on, on the very top. Okay. Then I will cut along a geodesic that goes through the root edge, and to the pointed vertex in the leftmost way. Okay, so there are many geodesics, but I take the leftmost one. Very important. I cut along that geodesic, and I get the picture that's on the on the bottom, and I can reconstruct the original map by this uh, gluing pattern that's in gray. Okay, I just unfold it around the geodesic. Okay. Uh, now what I'm going to do is. Uh, because I have that point, pointed vertex, I'm going to write the distances from each vertex to the pointed vertex on the slice. And then I'm going to look at the face that's on the left of the root edge here. And for each vertex on that face, I will look at the leftmost geodesic to the pointed vertex. That's my strategy. So it's going to give me something called the slice decomposition. Uh, so I look at that face, and from that vertex to the pointed vertex, it's a geodesic of, of length 2. Okay? From that vertex, because it has a greater distance than the, than the other one, the leftmost geodesic will go through that vertex. Okay? So that's very important. And then from here to uh, the top vertex, it's just like that. So now I cut along those geodesics to get new slices. It's an iterative procedure, recursive procedure. Uh, I get a, a trivial slice here because, as I told you, this guy is at a further distance than this guy. So the leftmost geodesic goes like this first. And then, so I have uh, three slices here that I can glue together back to obtain uh, my origi original map. So now how to characterize the sequence of slices that we use. It's actually sufficient to keep track of the, the distances. Okay? And uh, I will show you how to calculate the generating functions of slices. So I call that generating function T. Yeah. It is, it is. Yeah, sure, sure. It's, a, it's bijective. It's totally unique because of the pointed vertex. You take the leftmost. Yeah. It's very important to take the leftmost. Uh, so you look at the, the sequence of distances along the, the blue-greenish uh, face. So it can go up or down, and you encode that into a dick path. So a dick path is a path that goes up and down uh, by one at each step. And every time you go up, it means that the geodesic distance increases, so the leftmost geodesic would go back to the previous vertex. So whenever you have an up step on the dig path, you cannot glue anything, okay? because the leftmost geodesic goes backwards. But whenever uh, the dig path goes down, so the distance decreases, you can glue any slice. Okay? That's the magic. So basically, the generating series is given by that uh, equation, where you have an empty slice, then the number of paths with k down step, and t to the k. OK, cool. So now, now we're not done at all, because it would be pointless if we cannot remove the pointed vertex. Right? Uh, 
Um, it would be pointful, but. Uh, and that's a, another technique by Bouti and Guitter in the same paper. That's a really beautiful technique. So they say omega zero one is the, the number of uh, maps that are pointed at distance zero from the root, obviously. And they say, let's rewrite that as a difference uh, where I point at a distance, any distance from the root, but such that the root has the smallest label of the root face. So it looks complicated. But this is what gives you the map X of Z for the topological recursion. And then you remove what you didn't want, which is uh, the same thing at a greater distance. Okay, and if you look at the first parenthesis uh, and you call that quantity Z, it's actually a set of something that we call non-empty excursions, which are dig path that are non-empty. Non and so they stay above the positive axis so they start with an upstep like that. And the upstep is decorated by X, the catalytic variable. And then you can decorate every triangle the, the, with any path. So one plus Z, basically. So, so you have a clear combinatorial interpretation of this variable Z. And that gives you the mapping that you look for in the topological recursion. Why? I don't know. It's just that it works. Okay. So basically, W01 is given by that expression here in terms of Z. And so uh, when I saw the, the talk by Marvin, I was thinking, oh, this is, really, uh, this is really looking like what he was talking about, because that's an expansion in Z, OK, with a clear uh, combinatorial interpretation. So the real magic of slices, I don't have time to, to tell you about. But the real magic is when you look at the cylinder function, and you get the, f the famous results that you want through uh, a lot of non-trivial steps, but you get them. OK, so uh, I should probably conclude uh, pretty soon. So uh, the, we basically somehow, we can say that we got the most general planar map enumeration results in some appropriate sense, but getting the topological recursion is still a long story. And uh, the gist of it is that it's satisfied. And the main originality of our work is that you prove First TR with no internal faces, or you ask uh, better people to do it for you. And then, uh, so in, in the matrix model point of view, that would be the Gaussian case. Okay? So no potential. And then you deform the spectral curve. And that's a cool idea that was at the origin of the Enarorentin topological recursion. Uh, I've never really seen it used uh, in a concrete example, so that was one of the motivations to do that. So basically, the, the spectral curve deformation tells you how it behaves, how the TR behaves when you change the initial data, when you change the spectral curve. And you ha then you have to show that your objects, they fit in that framework. So just to tell you uh, how to do that, uh, like the, the basic principles, you define the correlators for constellations, uh, omega gn, and you define the, some correlators through the topological recursion for the same curve, omega tilde. And you want to show that omega and omega tilde are the same. Okay? So you will perform some uh, Feynman expansion on both sides, basically. Order by order in alpha, where alpha is a parameter that counts the number of internal faces. Um, OK, so I think I'm going to skip that. But basically, this tells you how it's basically the Feynman expansion for matrix models if you were in the context of matrix models. It would tell you that instead of having all marked faces, you can remove the marking and put a P instead. Okay? So that's really what the Feynman expansion does. OK, and so we write omega gn as a, as a formal uh, series of uh, chi, gn and l, where l is the perturbation order. And then you can show the same similar expansion for the topological recursion that's based on the Rauch uh, variational formula, these kind of things. And then you have to prove that both chi and chi tilde are determined by the same recursion, which is really the key ingredient. Uh, so the chi's, they satisfy a, a sort of topological recursion with different coefficients because they have more parameters. And voila. 
Okay, so the conclusion is just a, su uh, a, a, a sum up of what I told you about. I think the important part is that um, then you can generalize this approach to uh, all rational weights. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the KP hierarchy and the TR, obviously universal structures in that context. And I like the idea of using the deformation of spectral curve because it's simpler to prove things uh, for in the Gaussian case with no internal faces. And then, um, so obviously you need someone to do that first, and then you can try to deform. Okay, that's gonna be it. Thank you. Thank you.